Okay. And again, uh, today's conversation, the way that we run these webinars at CCWT is very informal. Um, I'm just going to ask Adriana a few questions. We're going to have a conversation. If anybody has any questions, please put them in the chat and I'll try to get to them. I could moderate. Um, but if I could just frame the issues that we're talking about for everyone, and again, And Adriana's a world expert on organizational change and reform. And right now, as all of you know, we're in a moment where career readiness, you know, whether or not our students, whether we're in a research university or a community college or somewhere in between, whether or not our students are going to get a job and a well-paying one at that when they graduate is a pressing concern. And of course, many of you are aware of the debt crisis and the rising price tag of college. That's on everybody's minds, especially students and their families. And so whether or not there's a job waiting for them at the other end is becoming a huge issue politically and institutionally. And so the context in which I had invited Adriana to make her remarks was as provosts, chancellors, system heads, um, deans are asking their faculty and their career centers to do more and to do better and to make sure that all of their graduates are career ready, I thought it would be very useful for us to take a step back and think about, well, what do we know about change in higher education and what works and what doesn't work? Because right now there's a whole lot of change messages coming from all directions about this career readiness issue. Um, and so I guess, Adriana, if we could start, um, you know, what are some key insights that you think are salient for all of us. And again, the audience of these webinars is often people working in career centers or directly involved in the career development of students. So what do you think are some of the key insights from the change literature that you think we should be aware of? Yeah, I think one of the first things that you need to be aware of is um, that this type of change, which um, would seem you know, to be so common sense, right? And that should be so easily accepted by various people on campus, especially as you were saying that in light of all of these external calls for higher education to um, attend to these issues around career readiness. Uh, but one of the insights from my research is that um, changes that, uh, try to alter the sort of the core values of higher education um, are more difficult and that um, this type of change, while lots of external groups are interested, really does um, challenge some of the uh, you know, core internal values of higher education institutions. Um, there has been you know, a long tradition of higher education uh, seeing its commitment to liberal arts education and um, separating, there's this tradition of separating that from vocation and career. Um, there's a lot of work recently, and I'll talk about this I think later, um, trying to break down that, that sort of separation um, of these two value systems. But that is the that is the historic set of values that exist. So even as you come in and you're thinking about, well, you know, this everybody should understand how common sense this kind of change is. Um, understanding the history of higher education and how that is sort of then deeply embedded in the structures and the policies and the the overall culture will help you to understand why you might face resistance. And I think that that's what's always surprising to people is they don't expect the kind of resistance um, when they're engaging in something that's really a, a culture type of change. And that's what I would say career readiness uh, in many campuses, not all campuses, but um, across most kinds of institution that it ends up, um, you know, you know, challenging some of the underlying mission and value system. Um, and you take that in conjunction with the fact that higher education institutions in general 
right? They're called institutions because they're supposed to be enduring and non-changing. That's like the nature of institutions, like whether it be hospitals, you know, um, have, we have various uh, institutions in our society that we are trying to protect them from external influences and want them to focus and center um, on their mission. So higher education really has a protective membrane around it to stay focused on the, you know, on the, the course that it's been set. So um, you're trying to introduce a culture change into an already set kind of institution that has um, set itself up to be a little bit uh, impenetrable uh, and impervious to changes. So I think understanding that um, helps you go into a change process differently, understanding that um, you, you first need to really um, focus on um, having conversations about, um, you know, what are, what are people's kind of beliefs and assumptions about this change, trying to unearth kind of any um, pushback or resistance, trying to understand that first, I think, can be really important um, rather than just kind of, you know, moving forward with the assumption that because this is a common sense, important change, that people will, you know, go along and follow and be engaged and um, bringing in some of, you know, some conversations first, really. I always say, like, when something's about culture change, start with conversations with your key stakeholders so that, you can understand the views. Now, some of you may be on campuses where, um, you know, there are some campuses that have history and tradition that focus on career and vocation. And then that will be a different um, set of, you know, you'll understand that pretty quickly. But many of you will be on campuses where it's changed some mind part Okay, thank you, Adriana. Um, now, it, it occurred to me that it may be useful as a way to frame the rest of our um, hour together. If any of you out there have any specific change strategies that you're grappling with right now at your campuses with respect to career readiness, I think that'd be great to share. Like maybe you have a dean that's saying everybody must teach soft skills in the classroom, um, which is something that I see a lot of. Or maybe there's, um, uh, you know, you're part of a system and there's a new system mandate that all students have internships, which is another thing I see a lot of. Um, but if you could share some of the change strategies you're seeing and maybe some issues with them. Um, Adriana brought up this idea of resistance. And I know that that is something that is commonly encountered, whether it's resistance from leadership or faculty or academic staff. Um, and so maybe there's some resistance that you're encountering that you'd like to get Adriana's thoughts on. So if you have any um, ideas um, or questions or thoughts, please put them in the chat. Um, but I'd like to follow up on one thing, Adriana. Oh, did you have a question or a point? No, just one other thought. So, I mean, as you all are thinking about some of your strategies, I did want to mention um, that we have a great resource at the Polio Center. It's called the Change Leadership Toolkit. And for if you're, as we're thinking about, I was trying to describe to you what are some of the things you might face in terms of resistances, but we've also done a lot of work on what helps facilitate change. And so this change leadership toolkit is a, is a tool that's meant to help people like you as you're thinking about engaging in, um, you know, a, a large scale change. And so it helps uh, you to understand um, and reflect on your context and what are some of the um, potential opportunities and barriers that so give you some questions to register both, you know, things that'll help propel the change forward, what we call levers, levers of change, and it gives you examples of levers, as well as things you might want to look out for on, this, the, on the front of resistance. But it also outlines um, eight key um, leadership strategies that have been proven to help um, support change on campuses. And so, those of you who are in sort of maybe maybe the vision sort of expectations 
um, sort of that beginning process that outlines how to do that, how to develop your resources to support your vision and a plan, how to create the kind of team and human resource capacity around um, a change initiative, how to develop a really good communication plan, which is ongoing in any change, you've got to continue to communicate on an ongoing basis. Politics, which um, are ever present in higher education, but yet um, many change leaders kind of avoid sort of the political landscape. Um, and that's really important to engage if you want to be successful in change. Um, it talks about what we call sense making strategies or learning strategies. How do you help people to under, understand more about career readiness so that they're able to engage those ideas, especially Matt, as you were saying, and say, you know, faculty that are asked to do something in their classroom, but they don't really understand exactly what it is that they're, they're trying to do. Um, and then planning for long term success. So looking at how you evaluate and measure and look at the work that you're doing. So um, those of you who are maybe engaged in any of those types of strategies that I imagine you, you will be over time, this is a really um, powerful toolkit that helps you to, uh, to understand and assess your efforts and to reflect with your team on how to move forward on change. And I do see we're having getting some questions coming in, Matt, so we may want to take up some of those. Yeah, we will, but I, I need to take this opportunity to ask you some questions, Adriana. And I'm going to put in the chat, everybody, um, Dr. Kizar's webpage at USC. But if there's any other links you think Adriana would be useful, um, please put them in. I will. Um, I recommend everybody take a look at Adriana's um, writings, her book, How um, Colleges Change, many of her articles, which have been deeply influential. Um, it's a treasure trove of insights. And one of the great things, Adriana, I've always admired about your work is you're always attentive to the practitioners and the implications of theory and the research findings for people actually doing the work. And one of the things as an anthropologist I've really liked about your work is the C word that you've already mentioned, culture. Um, and we'll get to the decentralization questions in a minute, but I think the culture question is really important as we think about working, whether we're in a decentralized or centralized campus or career services model, how culture affects this, um, how culture affects the way we approach career readiness. And so I'd, could you just um, speak a little bit about your 2002 article? Um, you know, the because there's different ways that higher ed and org researchers have thought about culture. Um, some have created archetypes or typologies of entire institutions like UW-Madison as a managerial culture, um, you know, and that's one way that we have approached that question of culture in higher ed, that every campus has one kind of at the institutional level. But there's also been research showing that, well, departments at the meso level may have unique cultures. Um, and then if you wanna go even lower to the classroom level, and so Adriana, can you speak a little bit about this question of culture at different levels and maybe how that may influence how we're thinking about some of these change strategies? Yeah, I think even appreciating as you're bringing up Matt, that, um, that each campus um, has a culture that is going to, you know, and we only, know it often when we go to another campus. It's sometimes really hard to see our own culture, uh, particularly the only campus we've been on. It becomes, you know, like the air we breathe or, you know, if you're a fish, it's the water that surrounds you. And so you often have trouble seeing um, the culture. And, and, and so uh, that's what makes culture sometimes so challenging to address is, is just being able to identify it. But I think um, as you become aware of that your campus is going to have an environment. Um, uh, and one of the ways, as Matt, you were saying, we understand this is, um, you know, some of the big sort of indicators of, of different sort of aspects of culture, like um, your institutional type, right? So we know that a small liberal arts college has a, you know, a deeper commitment to often for the teaching mission and kind of the smaller, more intimate student uh, experience, whereas a larger say, research university um, 
orients and supports more sort of um, the research enterprise, um, often has a more large and depersonalized environment. So we can see culture sometimes in these stark contrasts between uh, institutional types. But what becomes, you know, uh, more important, I think, to change processes, and, and um, this is why the Change Leadership Toolkit is really helpful, is it kind of walks you through a series of areas questions that help you to identify as you're saying that like at the sort of institutional level how do we look at say how people communicate or collaborate as indicators of the culture so some campuses are very um, siloed fragmented disconnected as we said others have strong um, relational communities where people interact a lot so the change leadership toolkit helps you walk through a series of questions around some of these elements of the culture of your campus. But you could also do the same assessment, Matt, as you're saying, at the college level or at the departmental level, depending on where you're working, you can vary up the questions to then understand um, what your local institutional or departmental culture is like what it represents, and then how that means you have to shift and change your approach um, to moving forward with the, the change process. And so Matt, if you're referring to one of the um, studies that I did, looked at whether you can just move forward, say, I brought up that idea of the communication strategy as a part of the change process. Um, that needs to always be, um, modify and is dependent on your setting. So there's not like just a universal sort of communication strategy that you can engage on your campus um, that you can kind of pull off the shelf from reading about change literature. You really need to say, okay, wait, we're on a very small campus that is built on informal relationships. So our communication strategy that therefore needs to be informed by um, that culture. And so it needs to be shaped differently than, say, if you are on a very large decentralized campus, your communications plan is probably going to have to be very multi level, you know, ongoing to be hard to, um, because of the size, to reach um, people. Often people are less engaged or disconnected. There might be a lot more formal communication, a lot more forums, and, and, and ways that you try to engage people who may naturally be less engaged. So just taking that one example, um, a very different approach to a you know unknown change strategy that's important, um, but you have to vary it up based on the type of campus that you're at. Great, thank you, Adriana. Um, I'm I'm still getting used to Zoom after two years. Like different things, you have to click. And, and I, I warned you, Adrian, I, I sent you a list of questions and I've already veered off my script because there's so many great things to follow up on. But maybe we could turn to one of the questions um, from Stephanie. Have you experienced a model change from a centralized career center to a more embedded decentralized model? Um, does that resonate with you, Adriana? Um, or should we ask Stephanie to follow up and clarify? I, I think, look, she can tell me this is true, that you're saying a campus that had, you know, a more centralized system is moving towards embedding career services across different colleges and sort of like, you know, the, is it about the, maybe you can tell us, is it about the pros and cons of such an approach or is it about um, executing on that approach? I was thinking more on the executing of that approach and if you've seen any schools do that well. So um, I, I am familiar with many campuses that have moved in that direction. You know, I think this is one of the, um, you know, it, it is, again, a sort of an issue of um, culture and structure and fit. you know, campuses can have various kinds of approaches to doing this work and each can be successful it does really depend on you know it seems like more decentralized campuses then move to um, I think 
ultimately many of the most successful models are, are call it or like a matrix right they have some kind of centralized support and then decentralize some of the effort out into the um, schools and colleges um, and that there's a benefit to having a little bit of both um, but there is I think a movement out there to do kind of one or the other um, and I think that the you know the the key uh, issue is as you're moving this out into um, various schools and colleges that have not been as engaged um, directly in the work as they, you know, uh, as before, is just how to educate um, everyone enough within the decentralized schools and colleges so that they understand the new approach. I haven't seen um, a lot of resistance going that way. Usually the resistance is if you're trying to move from a decentralized model up to a centralized model, there tends to be more resistance. Bringing it back down in to um, the schools and colleges, I, I have seen you know, more support for. So it's really just then like a really engaging in what I call the sense making or learning efforts that people understand the new structure. Um, a little bit around focusing on the resources and support um, for for the various efforts because I've seen sometimes those have failed because they didn't get enough resources support as they got decentralized out into the various schools and colleges. So more sort of some of the things that you need to attend to, but I have seen, as I said, less resistance going in that direction, a little bit more of an easier flow. I don't know if that uh, helps fully answer your question, Stephanie. And Matt, I don't know if you have anything to throw in on your end, because I'm sure you've observed some of these trends as well. Yeah, the, the question of, you know, centralizing career services and some of these approaches is, I think, one of the biggest in the field right now. And if I could, I'm not going to offer my own insights, but if I could layer on to this, a question I have for you, Adriana, because right now we're focused on, you know, intra-institutional bridge building, right, or partnerships. But one of the, the key issues in the career readiness efforts is helping our students become more attuned to the realities of the workplace, right? And some of that is going to involve building relationships with employers, whether it's faculty employer relationships or departmental, you know, internship coordinator relationships. But this this is a, it introduces another layer or complexity to this question, I think, because we're talking about external organizations or employers. So do you have any thoughts on that, um, you know, from the perspective, you know, with your hat on as a, a change strategist, how you could um, advise people as they're dealing with bridge building um, outside of campus and um, developing those collaborations? So a couple of things, like just from our own research over the years, we, you know, again, at higher education as an institution, it's slower to support partnerships. They're less adaptable and flexible than other kinds of organizations that are, you know, more nimble to be able to develop partnerships. But there's been a huge trend over the last 30 years in particular with, um, you know, a lot of support and pressure on higher education to develop external partnerships, particularly around community engagement and service learning efforts. That's been a really big um, initiative over the past 20 or 30 years that really opens the door. I mean, that can be in many ways uh, sort of a partner to you, maybe knowing about what efforts on campus have been involved with community engagement, service learning, really can be a venue into um, understanding how to get support for some of these external partnerships because those efforts already are happening on your campus. Um, but two things we've we've learned over time about higher education when it gets involved in partnerships. First is it doesn't tend to be as mutual. We tend to go out and partner and do things that are in our best interest and don't provide what we, you know a kind of mutual um, uh, you know mutual benefit. And then these partnerships often don't sustain, and that's been a problem. So I think the ways that you can think about how is this mutually beneficial and and making the and 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 leading with like as we're going to develop a partnership how do we make this mutually beneficial will help in the long term um the other um 
issue is that often there's unequal sort of power relationships where the university um, has often more power than some of the either community agencies they've been partnering with. This may be a little less of an issue with um, some of the career readiness because I think some of the, the businesses um, industry can often be on equal ground or footing, but you might also be partnering with, for example, maybe a government agency around, um, you know, some of the career readiness and there may, and so sometimes, and also you might be working with community agencies as it relates to certain careers, that unevenness can um, create tension in the relationship. So just being attentive to how do you ensure that both partners feel like they're on the same footing or attentive to maybe people feeling slighted, um, as well as how do you think about kind of a mutual benefit so that the so that the partnerships are sustained. It's a lot of effort to create partnerships. So if they um, fall apart, then um, you know, that's a lot of effort that's got, you know, um, gone for you know, no positive outcome. So I think um, the ways that you can sort of Think about these issues on the front end can help for the longer term success of partnerships. Great, thank you, Adriana. And when I dove into the interorganizational literature a few years back um, in the business and management research, I think the failure rate of partnerships in general is very, very high. And one of the recommendations they had is something you mentioned earlier at the very beginning: is just talk, get everybody around the table have a conversation about your expectations, your norms, you know, what are the actual tasks you're talking about? What's the mutual benefit or lack thereof? And I, I'm surprised at the lack of conversations that sometimes happen at the beginning of especially grant funded initiatives or partnerships um, where it's just, okay, we secured the funding, let's go to work. And some of the basic stuff hadn't been talked about. Yeah, no, that's really important. And, and, and even just um, one of those foundations, both in those conversations, is, is the how we're going to structure, we're going to work together. What are how are we going to make decisions? What is sort of the the governance, if you will, of the partnership? And that is also one of the things that um, you know often destroys sort of partnerships. Is somebody feeling like a decision that got made, you know, breaks down trust that um, people didn't have enough sort of input on. So really developing kind of the you know. The processes you will follow, so that you're, you're, you know, it's all. It is about relationships and trust, and there are many uh, um, aspects um, that, um, or, or there's many ways that you can establish the partnership for success. Or as you're saying, if you're not intentional, that it just then kind of devolves over time. Yes, and, and that you've brought up two of my favorite words, culture and trust. Um, and, and there's quite a lot of research and management about the role of trust in collaborative work and how important it is. Would you say, Adriana, that some of these issues we're talking about, about university external partner relationships apply equally to within campus, like say academic affairs and maybe the chemistry department and career services? Or do the same principles apply? Well, I mean, I, I, I think they do. I think that there's, um, you know, there's some, uh, you know, because of the, you know, the internal structures, there's um, more of, uh, you know, there's there's more of a reason that the partnership will, will likely have success just because, they're, you know, when you're partnering with external groups, um, you're bringing in people that aren't naturally going to collaborate and kind of within campuses, um, we don't often collaborate, but there is sort of a more inherent logic to suggest that um, groups should be working with each other across and more support for those kinds of um, relationships. But we have all sorts of historic um, hierarchies, um, ways that campuses have been siloed, politics, all of these things that have made many groups on campus um, very wary of each other. Right now, we have a historic rift, I think, between staff and faculty um, that is uh, much larger than it's been in the past. I think staff feel particularly coming out of the pandemic um, that they were very disenfranchised, um, you know, and 
faculty members also felt in different ways they were, but like that the you know many groups are um, feeling at odds with each other. So I think we're in an environment that's particularly fraught for trying to work in a collaborative nature, and that builds on a history where certain groups like academic affairs and student affairs felt like they, um, you know, often didn't have strong working relationships. So you're building on a stress on top of already some historic sort of not strong working relationships. So um, internal collaborations can be challenging for the same reason that bringing people together to, to unearth some of the um, ways that um, people might be um, concerned or, or, uh, or, or adverse to collaborating and getting those out uh, in the open is really important if we're gonna move forward on trying to have different groups work together right now that just um, are feeling, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really challenging time to ask people to work together, I think. Yes, and to ask people to do more. Um, yeah. Because one thing I'm seeing, especially within departments, is some of the career readiness questions, many faculty don't feel like it's their job. Um, you know, in professional programs, that's different. In some campuses where the culture is focused on career development, that's different. Um, but many faculty do feel like, no, that's career services job. Um, my job is to teach the content. Yeah, no, I think that, you know, we just, you know, haven't done a great job of um, helping. I, I mean, I think there are so many small and easier ways to involve faculty as, as partners in this work. Um, but as you're saying, part, we do need to appreciate the, um, that faculty have been in, a, in an onslaught the past couple of years of like, change the way that you're doing your teaching, you know, move everything online, use different, you know, Method. So there's been a lot on the support students' mental health, which has been really diff you know, difficult. There's been all sorts of additional supports that faculty have had um, to provide for students with it. All these different pressures. And then th there's, no there's nothing that's lightened up in terms of expectations for them around doing research and scholarship um, all, all of, of this type of service. So, you know, every it's just a real crunch for faculty. But I think um, starting with these conversations about, um, I love the studies that have been done um, by Becky Packard and um, an issue for like one or two minutes. She was having them talk about a little bit about careers in, in the STEM area. And I think that this, you know, this whole idea of small kinds of things that um, we can engage faculty in that can have a big impact and that they can see that it isn't, a, you know, this giant sort of switch that, that they need to make. Um, and also just helping understand them to understand the kind of significant impact that they have, particularly among first generation, low income and racialized minority students who don't have time often to engage in extracurricular activities, co-curricular activities, um, because of their, you know, the amount that they're working and the amount that they're trying to engage in other activities, so that the faculty really is maybe one of their only interfaces, classroom and faculty. And so helping um, the faculty to understand what a critical um, juncture they are for so many students and that there's no other place. They may never be able to get to the, for example, career center, because they're just that that strapped in terms of time. Um, I think um, using that data, we, there's a lot of good data to support this, you know, um, it helps you to build the case with faculty about how important they are um, in in this work. And, and you can provide them easy strategies that don't take a lot of time for them to add on to their already busy plate. Great, thank you. And if anybody has any questions for Adriana, um, please put them in the chat. We are nearing the end of our webinar. And again, um, Adriana, thank you for joining me in this conversation. And one of the, the 
papers, one of your many papers that I've really enjoyed over the last few years was a 2018 paper that you had in Change Magazine. I highly recommend it to everybody out there. Um, I think it's relevant for this career readiness question. Um, it's called How Organizational Silos and Bridges Shape Student Success, the CSU STEM Collaboratives Project. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit, Adriana, about some of the key findings from that paper, but with respect to this question of the silos that exist between career services and faculty, because I think I mentioned to you, you know, our research on internships, it's saying exactly what you just said. They're, they're not accessible to all students, especially low-income working um, students who just don't have time to do study abroad or internships or some of these high-impact practices. And so this is a question. How do we deal with the siloed nature of many of our departments and campuses. And one of the great messages of this um, article, everyone, is this idea of holistic reform, um, that we don't have a, a silver bullet that's gonna change everything. I think we all know that that's, even though it's very common in education, you know, whether it's K-12 or higher ed, we know it doesn't work. And so can you speak a little bit about some of the findings from this um, paper, Adriana? Yeah. So, um, just so you all know, so the background was we had um, eight CSU campuses that um, engaged in an initiative to help more low-income, first-generation, racialized minority students to be successful in STEM. And the um, initial idea was um, that we know high-impact practices have, um, you know, uh, you know, can have an impact you know, a very large impact on students. So high impact practices would include things like internships and apprenticeships, but um, are also things like service learning or study abroad or um, using collaborative and active learning in the classroom. So the whole variety of um, practices that we know um, support student learning. And so we went into the study where the campuses were gonna integrate, um, they were gonna, transform, uh, most of them had summer bridge programs. So they were gonna implement um, some high impact practices in a summer bridge program in the kind of first year experience. And they were gonna transform their, um, their uh, you know, sort of initial um, intro uh, STEM courses. So they were kind of doing the work along that first year. Um, but what ended up coming out of the study was it was less important to these specific high impact practices. We couldn't see like one or the other that sort of like really was the highlight of why students were successful. But the improved retention rates, improved success of the students really came out of what we called a unified community of support where students felt that um, they had a you know, a group or community of educators across different areas that were um, supporting them uh, through their success. And that occurred because we had these teams that implemented this, this transformation of the first year. And those teams included people in academic affairs and student affairs, and they learned a lot from each other. The people in academic affairs learned a lot about how about student support and student needs. And those in student support learned a lot about the challenges that um, faculty were facing in the classroom and some of the issues that emerged. So there was a lot of this cross conversation that never happened. It also included administrators that uh, affected policies related to students. Um, you know, so whether it was um, you know a particular policy around uh, how they could enroll in a certain course that might throw them off from getting into what they needed to be taking that, you know, uh, you know, destabilize that student. So it was like bringing people together that usually don't have a conversation about student support holistically and who were also engaging with these students um, in, in, in this process. So they were, they were learning and talking to the students and then changing all sorts of um, different policies and practices but they were they were coming together and and really sort of um, being able to exchange information that helped uh, them in supporting students differently. So um, 
you know, it would be like a faculty member who, who realized in their class that, you know, I need to support students in a certain way, but then they now had a contact over in student affairs that they could easily ask the question and, um, and bring those resources into their classroom in ways they never could before. So it was this, the ways that they created these connections um, across these different spheres of student support. So we ended up calling this the unified um, community of support because um, that is what we really need on campuses if we want to make students successful is a lot of this kind of cross-functional work and, and engagement. Yeah, and I, I'm trying to find the link to the paper, but I highly recommend all of you read this. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, and maybe this will be my last question, Adriana. Um, and if anybody has any questions or comments, please put it in the chat. Um, this is a rare hour to have, again, one of our leading experts on higher education reform and change processes. I'm curious, Adriana, in that study, if you found any um, common element or ingredient for these campuses where such a unified system of support was possible. Because as you've mentioned earlier, on some of our campuses, we have historic divisions and silos and politics that keep that from happening. So was there any common commonality where you found this possible in this working? You're looking a little bit more for the uh, the silver bullet solution. I would I would say. I know I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean I think you know we were able to construct because of you know um, I think what we foisted on these campuses like to get the grant funding they had to work differently they had in the past we we knew that you know kind of a cross functional team was going to be really important to the work we didn't understand exactly the ways why but because we you know imposed that and got buy-in from them right to do the work in that way so i think how do you it's really a question of how do you get support on your campus for working across and collaborating and um, how do you even get a conversation uh, started about um, rethinking the, our, our, you know, our processes so that we're engaged more with the important departments and groups that we need to be? Um, I would say that one of the, what, what we're trying to do um, on a different study that I'm engaged in right now is take the model that I've used on some of these other studies of these, you know, very robust cross-functional teams that have, you know, members from senior administration, mid-level administration, grassroots sort of faculty and staff, and across different divisions and groups coming together. Um, we're, put, we're using those, we're calling, you know, the model of like a professional learning community that engages the question. So, if, you know, you could bring together a professional learning community on your campus that, that talks about how can we have the most robust career readiness um, program. And if you engage all those kind of different groups in that conversation, um, what we're finding is that, you know, a really strong um, vehicle for propelling uh, that kind of change forward, um, getting the sort of necessary leadership and the necessary conversation. So um, if you're able to get, I mean, you may not be able to get, you know, all the ideal groups, but even like, a, you know, kind of a large uh, like whatever you can sort of uh, assemble in that kind of conversation, I think um, helps, you know, to move towards, it's a, it's a strong vehicle to move towards that kind of collaboration. That's great. And my final question is, do you have any advice for, say you assemble this learning community and you bring together people, say from service learning and internship coordinators and career services and faculty. Because I've been in some of those meetings with those parties and there's definite turf issues um, where people feel like, no, we're doing that already. Um, do you have any advice for how to navigate some of these tricky turf issues where, because career readiness does implicate a lot of our work across units. Um, and so this will come up. Yeah, no, and it, and actually it's come up in this other project that I was talking about where um, they're trying to elevate a certain support 
um, system for student success. And other groups are saying, right, well, we already do this. You know, it's, it's that the same thing like, and I don't know why we want to allocate resources or energy or priorities to this initiative. And, you know, that's what it sometimes does come down to, right, is part of these sort of wars and issues are, are essentially back to resources and um, kind of even understanding and acknowledging that um, we're in a, a resource tight environment. Um, and so I think bringing to the surface those issues of um, what are the real underlying concerns um, around like whether it be, you know, I mean, the threats are often restructuring so that, that people can sometimes find threatening um, kind of changes in resources. And um, I, I think that, um, you know, as campuses come together, they do need to kind of appreciate the, the issue of how finite resources are in this environment and that there are these, there are conflicting priorities. And, um, and that, you know, part of coming together as a campus community is, um, as you were saying in the conversations, is, is to bring up those issues of differing priority and, and try to see where there can be some common ground um, together. And it's, um, you know, the, the politics can be uncomfortable, but, you know, ignoring them doesn't help uh, in moving to sort of the 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 next phase. So I think, um, you know, you just have to get comfortable with some of those conversations that happen, but be willing, I think to, you know, I think the best thing is to, is to take people aside who, who like express the truth issues and, and more one-to-one -one conversations with them um, can really kind of break down sometimes. I mean, they're really fighting often for what they think, um, is something that's going to be attacked, um, you know, that they're trying to protect. So I think understanding that and the ways that you can create some mutuality in terms of that you really are trying to meet some of the same goals can kind of shed or melt some of that, um, you know, kind of infighting that is quite common on our campuses. That's really great, Adriana, thank you. Um, and some of what you've been talking about makes me think that many campuses need an internal anthropologist who understands each of these cultures and can speak across difference, knit together the common areas of collaborative opportunity, um, and then deal with the resource constraints, the politics, the institutional mission. Much easier said than done. Um, but thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your experience with all of us um, on this topic of career readiness. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us. Um, it's been great talking to you, Adriana. Thanks, Matt. Great to be here. And I wish you all luck in your future endeavors. Okay. Bye everyone for now. And thank you again, Adriana. Of course. Take care. Bye.